we'll start now. You are on, David. Good morning, everyone. Uh, David Bean, current president of the World Affairs Council. Thanks to everyone for joining us today about a topic that's been on everyone's mind for at least the last year, inflation. Um, so today we're going to hear from Philip Orlando and his team, consisting of Steve Dichter, Sam McGowan, and Philip Pappas, about where the winds of inflation are blowing us. Philip Orlando is Senior Vice President and Chief Equity Market Strategist at Federated Hermes. He is also Senior Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager with 32 years of industry experience and is responsible for formulating and articulating Federated's opinions about, mar about equity markets and as well as positioning strategies for the firm's products. He serves as chair of both the macroeconomic policy and the prison assets committees of the company. And additionally, he is head of the company's balanced macro team. He is also the senior portfolio manager uh, of the company's asset allocation fund. Previous associations include chief information officer and senior portfolio manager for Value Line and Chief Information Officer and Portfolio Manager for First Capital Advisors. Mr. Orlando received his bachelor's and master's degrees from NYU. Uh, it is a privilege to have you and your team with us today. Philip, take it away. David, thank you very much for giving us the, uh, the opportunity to share our thoughts with you. Uh, I've got my colleague, Sam McGowan, uh, who is going to uh, put a, a slide deck up for me. Uh, in which we are going to address a number of key questions over the next few minutes. Inflation, uh, which uh, extraordinarily hot uh, uh, topic right now. Uh, interest rates, which have been rising in order to combat inflation. Uh, that Those two issues combine to address the key question, are we going into a recession at some point over the course of the next year or two? And then from an asset allocation standpoint, how should we be positioned? value versus growth, uh, and why dividends uh, matter so much in an environment uh, where interest rates and inflation uh, and recession risk are, are uh, so significantly challenging. So, uh, Sam, with that, why don't we flip over to the next page and we can get rolling. Um, I think for those that uh, are not familiar with my work, what I like to do is look at the uh, interrelationship uh, among many different inputs, uh, Washington, Main Street, Wall Street. And as we look at the environment that uh, we've been navigating over the last three years, uh, the first domino to fall, of course, was the exogenous event of, of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, there was a massive fiscal and monetary policy response uh, that's had an impact on the economy and the financial markets. And then we as voters uh, have the ability to uh, close that loop. Uh, we vote with our feet. Are we happy or unhappy uh, with the policy response that our elected officials in Washington put together? So we're going to be discussing all of this over the course of the next few minutes. So Sam, if you'd flip ahead to slide three. Um, last year, calendar 22 uh, was an extraordinarily difficult year, but in our view, it was predictably volatile in that it was a midterm election year. Uh, and and uh, what we saw last year was exactly what happens 
uh, in midterm election years over the course of the post-war history of the United States. Uh, you look at the panel there on the left, uh, you can see what we've done is we've broken out the S&P 500 performance over the last 75 years, uh, not just in terms of years, but in terms of quarters. And you will please note that, that in the middle of year two, last year, of course, being the second year of the four-year presidential election cycle, the stock market is consistently negative in the second and third quarters. Those are very typical responses, buyer's remorse, if you will, to the election results of the, the prior presidential election and the fiscal policies that have been put in place. Now, if you look at the panel to the right, you can see that we're tracking the S&P 500's performance in midterm election years over the last, oh, 60 years or so. The solid blue line is the average performance of every midterm election uh, since 1962. And you will please note that, that the market tends to trend down into that October period. And about a month before the midterm election, the market tends to enjoy a very powerful end of year rally based upon the expectation that there will be a change in control of government uh, and a better legislative check and balance. The light blue line is the performance of the S&P 500 last year calendar 22. And you can see how eerily the performance of the market last year was consistent with the performance of every midterm election over the course of the, uh, the last uh, 60 years. Uh, so uh, uh, what we're, we're going to do now is begin to shift our attention back to fundamentals. So uh, Sam, if you'd flip ahead to slide four, that one of the biggest fundamental questions that, that we're addressing uh, is when you look at the surge in inflation to 41 year highs we saw last year and the significant spike in interest rates that the Federal Reserve has engineered to try to combat that inflation, uh, are we looking at an elevated risk of recession? So we've gone back over the last 93 years and looked at the 15 recessions that, that the United States economy has, has suffered. And, and I think it's extraordinarily interesting that over those 15 recessions, over the last 93 years, all but one of them occurred in year four of the four-year presidential election cycle, that would be 2024, or year one, which would be, in this case, 2025. There's never been a recession that started in year three. This year is year three of the four-year presidential election cycle. So what's our current thinking? Well, it's important to understand the policy lag associated with the utilization of monetary policy to adjust the economy. That using monetary policy, the, the increase or decrease in interest rates that the Federal Reserve implements it is not like flipping a light switch on and off. It is much more like trying to turn a battleship in the ocean. It takes 12 to 18 months for the full effect of an interest rate change to begin to filter through the economy. So you look at what the Federal Reserve has done over the course of the last year or so. They started raising interest rates for the first time this cycle, March a year ago, March of 22, with a quarter point rate hike. But they didn't start to get serious until June of last year, June, July, September, November, we saw for the first time 75 basis point rate increases. So you add 18 months to the, the start of that process in June of last year, you come to the end of calendar 23. So it's our view that the elevated risk of recession probably starts at the very end of this year, the beginning of next year, and, and that's consistent with the historical precedent of calendar 24. Sam, if you flip ahead to slide five, I talked about the impact and the importance of the political dynamic of what we're doing, specifically as it relates to fiscal policy. And the reality is that over the course of the last century, the, the control of Congress matters more than anything else in terms of, of, of stocks. Now, you look at this uh, histogram that I've got, and what this does is it breaks the S&P 500 performance based upon who controls the various levers in Washington what party controls the House, the Senate, and the White House. Now, over to the right-hand side, that blue polka dot bar, 9.8%, uh, 
that's the historical return of the S&P 500, given the uh, consolidation of power that's been consistent with what we've had in Washington in the last two years. The Democrats literally had control of every lever of government. Now, I've drawn a line over to the second bar to the left. This is the current configuration, a Democratic Senate, a Republican House, a Democratic president. You can see that over the course of the last century, the S&P 500 has performed about four percentage points better over history when you've had that sort of divided government. Divided government tends to work for the U.S. economy and the financial markets, and that is because you have that legislative check and balance. You tend to get better fiscal policies, and so the hope is that, that we'll do better uh, given divided government than we did over consolidated control of government. So, Sam, let's flip ahead to slide six, and let's start to get into the weeds on the issue of the day, inflation. Now, what this slide does here is it looks at the performance of retail inflation, the nominal consumer price index, on a year-over-year -year basis over the last 40 years. And average nominal inflation has averaged about 2.8% over the last 40 years. But if you look all the way to the far right, you can see the inflation that we've been dealing with in the more recent period. So in January of 2021, as we had a change in control of government, inflation was very benign, only 1.4% year over year. But over the course of the next 18 months, you can see inflation spiked to 9.1% by June of 22, the highest level of nominal inflation that we've seen in the United States in 41 years. That's the bad news. The good news is that as a result of monetary policy from the Federal Reserve, those, in, uh, those inflation rates have started to come down. We've gone from 9.1% in June of last year. We ended last year at 6.5%. So we're moving in the right direction. We're not quite there yet. We absolutely believe that inflation's peaked, and now it's just a question of order of magnitude, the pace, the trajectory of that decline in inflation. So Sam, flip ahead to slide seven. The obvious question is, well, what caused that spike in inflation. Why, if inflation was running at, you know, two, two and a half, three percent for the last 40 years, why did it suddenly spike up to 9.1 percent? And the answer is fiscal policy decisions. What I've got here is I've looked at a number of fiscal policy decisions that were significant over the course of history. And I want you to start uh, four bars up the CARES Act in March of 2020. As we uh, fell into the COVID pandemic, it required, in my view, a significant fiscal and monetary policy response in order to extricate the economy from the, the shortest but the deepest recession in history. So I have no problem uh, with the, uh, the, the CARES Act that we put in place in March of 2020. It was absolutely the right policy, and the amount of money that was spent was approximately 10% of, uh, of GDP at that time. However, the economy responded beautifully. And, and the next four things that we did, I questioned the efficacy of whether or not we needed to do th those things. So for example, phase four of the uh, uh, CARES Act, President Trump passed $900 billion in December of 2020. That amounted to an additional 4.3% boost of gross domestic product. Uh, the uh, President Biden came into office in March of 21, passed the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. That was also not necessary. Um, I have no problems with the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure plan that was passed in November of 21. Uh, the roads and the bridges, the electric grid, et cetera, in the United States are in desperate need of upgrading. Uh, and modernization, I have no problem with that. I have real problems with the $1.4 trillion Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in September of 22. That was another 7% boost to uh, gross domestic product. I think that was completely unnecessary. And then I list last the student loan bailout in progress. That's a $1.5 trillion program. It's in progress because the Supreme Court is currently reviewing the constitutionality of that program. In my own view, 
I think the Supreme Court will overturn it and it will disappear. But I could be wrong. If the Supreme Court comes out and says it's okay, that will be an additional one and a half trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus, which will probably boost inflation further. But if we just look at the four pieces that I've focused on collectively, that added about five and a half trillion dollars of stimulus, fiscal stimulus to the U.S. economy, about almost 26 percent of GDP. Sam, uh, flip ahead to slide eight, if you would. Now, I'm going to circle back. Why do I believe that that fiscal policy largesse was unnecessary? The answer is right here on slide eight. This is a picture of the most powerful V-bottom recovery uh, in the history of civilization that we experienced in the middle of calendar 2020. I'm going to make three points. Point number one is that when the COVID recession started in February of 2020, our work at Federated Hermes suggested that the economy uh, was going to be significantly uh, debilitated, but the recession was going to be relatively short. We would thought the recession would end by uh, uh, May or June of 2020. With the benefit of hindsight, the National Bureau of Economic Research, the government agency whose job it is to date and identify recessions, declared the end of the recession in April of 2020, two months earlier than our forecast. So it was the shortest recession in history, only two months, February to April, but it was the deepest recession in history, which brings me to point two. Look at that powerful V-bottom recovery in the middle of calendar 2020. Second quarter GDP growth was down by 30% quarter on quarter annualized. But the third quarter recovery was up by 35% quarter on quarter annualized. Again, the most powerful economic recovery that we've ever seen in, in the history of civilization. And point three, as a result of what I've just discussed, it was our forecast at Federated that the GDP output gap manifested in this slide would fully close by the second quarter of calendar 21. And you can see on the slide there towards the upper right-hand corner, that's exactly when the GDP output gap was fully closed. Conclusion, there was no need for the massive fiscal stimulus that we saw in the fourth quarter of calendar 20 or during calendar 21 or during calendar 22. The US economy had recovered fully and was absolutely raking in terms of economic performance. So Sam, flip ahead to slide nine. Let's take a look at some of the ramifications of what I've just discussed. Starting in the upper right-hand corner, tax revenues were not a problem. As you can see, tax revenues were at or near all-time record highs. The bottom corner, uh, the right-hand side, that didn't stop our elected officials from executing a surge in spending. And it was that surge in spending that created the spike in inflation. The Federal Reserve produced a white paper in August of last year that they presented at their annual symposium at Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And their conclusion was that 60%, 60 percent, six zero percent of the surge in inflation that we saw in calendar 20 and calendar 21 was a result of poor fiscal policy decisions. So the Federal Reserve is not raising interest rates and tightening policy because they want to. It's their belief that they did it because they had to. They had to bring inflation back under control and they had to counter the poor fiscal policy decisions that created the surge in inflation. If you look at the panel on the left, you can see the spike down in the uh, create, creating the massive fiscal deficit but that number is starting to improve uh, as the economy has started to grow again and we've stopped doing those massive fiscal stimulus packages. Now, on the next page, uh, we are sitting here uh, with right now $31.4 trillion in federal debt. Uh, we've got the debt ceiling crisis that uh, Dr. Yellen and Congress and the president are dealing with right now. Well, when you look at $31.4 trillion in debt, with a gross domestic product that's a little over $20 trillion, that means that your debt to GDP ratio is about 150%. Is that a big number? It's a massive number. It's not sustainable. Now, it's below the 250% that, that Japan is executing, 
but I don't think that's an appropriate touchstone for us. If you look at the slide on the panel to the left, go back to about the period of 2000, as we were transitioning from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration, the debt to GDP ratio at that time was about 50%. We have quite literally tripled the debt to GDP ratio over the last 20 years. And that number is not sustainable. Now, as you look at the panel on the right, it, it is absolutely true that, that this $31.4 trillion in debt, it, it, it doesn't matter if interest rates are zero. And a year ago at this time, interest rates were at zero, but they're not at zero now. Right? The Federal Reserve has taken interest rates up from zero bound up to 4.5%, and we think they're going higher which means that the amount of money that we, the federal government, is spending to service that debt, and there will be a crowding out effect in terms of economic impact. So Sam, if you flip ahead to the next page, the obvious question is, okay, given this surge in inflation, what is the government's response, specifically the Federal Reserve's response? And the answer is they raise interest rates to try to cool the economy. So what has the Federal Reserve done over the last year? Well, last March, they started by hiking interest rates by a quarter point, in May by a half point, in June, July, September, and November, 75 basis points each. And in December, they downshifted to a 50 basis point rate increase. So the upper band of the funds rate right now is at four and a half percent. We do not think they're done. It is our belief that the Federal Reserve probably has another 75 basis points of tightening to try to get ahead of inflation. We've got a meeting coming up next week. Uh, on February 1st, Wednesday, uh, we've been talking about a 50 basis point rate increase, uh, but Nick Timoros, who is the Fed whisperer over at the Wall Street Journal, uh, did an article earlier this week on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, lead slot above the fold, uh, in which he said the Fed is thinking about a 25 basis point rate increase. It is our belief that the Federal Reserve planted that story. Now, we would like the Fed to do a 50 basis point rate increase next Wednesday, but if they don't, if they do go 25, what I think we're looking at are three 25 basis point rate increases in a row. February 1st, next week, March 22nd, and May 5th. At that point, we think the Federal Reserve will go on pause. We will have gotten the upper band terminal rate up to five and a quarter percent. So Sam, if you flip ahead to the next page, I think this is the single most important slide in my deck. So if you only remember one thing, I want you to remember this slide. This looks at what might the Federal Reserve do next week and over the course of the next couple of months in relation to Fed policy over the last half century. So what we're measuring here are the last eight rate hiking cycles, and then today. So please note the first eight pairs of bars, the solid blue line that is, is where did the federal funds rate peak out when the Fed went on pause? The red line, the pink line, is where did nominal consumer price index peak out? And you will please note that in every instance, the Fed funds rate exceeded the uh, rate of uh, inflation, retail inflation, the consumer price index before the Fed went on pause. Now bring your eyes over to the last set of bars. The Fed funds rate right now, upper band is sitting at four and a half percent. We believe the Fed is gonna add another 75 basis points to that over the course of the next quarter or so, which will take the upper band of the Fed funds rate to five and a quarter percent. Now, inflation, which peaked out at 9.1% and has come down to 6.5%, by next March or April, we think that number will be down around 5.5%. So here's the question. If the Federal Reserve takes the Fed funds rate up to about 5.25%, but inflation is only down to about 5.5%, interest rates will not yet be above inflation. So what does the Federal Reserve do? Do they do what they've done every time over the last half century and keep taking interest rates up? Or do they say, you know what? Inflation has come down significantly over the last couple of months and, and we're gonna take it on faith 
that that trajectory of the decline in inflation is going to continue. So we're going to go on pause. I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that what I've just described is not yet priced into the market. So this is going to be a critically important question for the Fed to address at the next three policy setting meetings. Next Wednesday, March 22nd, May 5th. Do they continue taking the Fed funds rate to a level above inflation? Or does the level of inflation come down more sharply than we think? And therefore, we get a better balance between interest rates and inflation. How the Fed manages that question to a significant degree will determine economic growth and financial market performance. So Sam, if you'd flip ahead to the next page, what does this mean for the overall economy? Now, what we're looking at here on slide 13 is the relationship between the Fed funds rate, which I said is currently at 4.5% upper band, and benchmark 10-year treasury yields, which are sitting at about 3.5% right now. Fed funds rate are short rates, 10-year yields are longer rates. So what you're looking at right now is an inversion of about 100 basis points. And over the course of the last half century, whenever we've seen an inversion on funds the tens, you can see that has been enough to push the economy into recession. Those gray vertical bars you see on this slide are recession bars. Slam, Sam, flip ahead to the next page. Slide 14 looks at the same relationship a little differently, looks at the relationship between twos and tens. And right now, again, you've got about a 70 basis point inversion on twos to tens. Uh, this relationship has been inverted for the better part of the last 10 or 11 months. And again, you can see that whenever the twos to tens have been inverted, that's been a very reliable recession indicator. Uh, Sam, flip ahead to 15. The bond vigilantes would suggest we look at the three month to 10 year relationship. They think that's the best relationship in treasury yields. And you can see that right now we've got an inversion. And over the last half century, whenever these indicators have been inverted, again, that has been a very reliable uh, recession indicator. All right, let's flip ahead to slide 16. Let's shift gears a little bit. Let's look at some of the economic fundamentals. And the first one I want to talk about is the leading economic indicator, the LEI. The LEI is now negative 10 consecutive months, uh, 13 out of the last 14 months, 17 months over the last 19 months. And when we've seen relationships like this in the past, you can see very clearly from the slide, this has been a very reliable recession indicator. Flipping ahead of slide 17, let's talk about energy and the impact that this potentially may have on the economy and the recessionary cycle. Now, the rule of thumb uh, is that every one penny change in the retail price of gasoline at the pumps has an inverse $1.2 billion impact on consumer discretionary spending. So we go back and look at the last two years. The price of gasoline went from $2 a gallon to $5 a gallon. Obviously, that's a delta of $3 a gallon negative. So you would expect that that would have had a deleterious impact on economic growth last year of about two and a half percent. And in fact, the first half of last year, that's exactly what happened. GDP was down by 1.6% in the first quarter, down by six tenths of 1% in the second quarter. All right, that's the bad news. The good news is that energy prices are down over the last six months. We peaked out at $5 a gallon last summer. We're sitting at about $3.50 a gallon uh, now. So the price of gasoline has improved by 1.5%, uh, which means that you're adding uh, to GDP. In fact, third quarter GDP was a positive 3.2%. Fourth quarter GDP was just flashed this morning, and that was flashed at a positive 2.9%. So the relationship holds. When gasoline prices go up, that has a deleterious impact on economic growth. When gasoline prices go down, that feeds better consumption and allows gross domestic product to improve. So as we look ahead to the next slide, slide 18, let's look at the history of the WTI over the last 75 years. There is a very strong correlation between all oil price spikes and subsequent recessions. 
the, again, those gray bars, those vertical gray bars are recession bars in the post-war history of the United States. So you look to the far right, and over the last couple of years, the price of crude oil went from $35 a barrel all the way up to $130 a barrel a year ago, February. That's the bad news. The good news is that over the last year, crude oil has gone from 130 down to 70. Now, it's our belief that based upon the fundamentals that are underlying the energy market right now, we are setting ourselves up for a round trip in crude oil. We think crude oil prices are going higher. So, Sam, if you flip ahead to the next page, why do we believe that? Why do we believe that energy could round trip in 2023? Well, there are half a dozen reasons. Number one, U.S. dollar weakness. We believe that the dollar peaked versus the yen, the pound, and the euro last fall when it became apparent that the Federal Reserve was going to downshift from 75 basis points uh, in rate hikes at the beginning of November uh, down to 50 basis points in the middle of December. Uh, historically, there is an inverse relationship between dollar strength or weakness and the price of commodities like crude oil. Point number two. Uh, we believe that the EU and U.S. price caps on Russian crude will backfire. All that will do is force Russia to cut off Europe uh, from energy sales, and they will pump as much as they want and sell as much as they want uh, to their allies, China and India. China, the second largest economy in the world. India is number six. Number three, OPEC. OPEC Plus has cut two million barrels a day of production. Now, why did they do that? Because the largest member of OPEC plus is Saudi Arabia. And they've come out very frankly and said, look, we need crude oil at $90 a barrel in order to meet our own internal needs, uh, our social spending needs in, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia. As a result, you, you never want to bet against Saudi Arabia in terms of their ability to orchestrate a higher or lower energy prices based upon their manipulation of supply and demand balance. Point number four, uh, U.S. energy policy, specifically its mismanagement of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve has contributed uh, to a decline in energy prices last year, but I think an increase in energy prices this year. Well, why is that? We have taken the SPR down from a maximum uh, capacity of 714 million barrels uh, last year. We've currently taken that down to 360 million barrels. Uh, that is not sustainable. We need to refill the SPR. And the Biden administration has said, well, we're going to start refilling it when we get down to about $70 a barrel. Well, that happened about a month or two ago. And what's happened to energy prices over the last month or two? Well, they've gone from $70. We're into the low 80s right now. And we believe we're going higher. Uh, point number five, the winter. Uh, in the week before Christmas, we had brutal winter, the bomb cyclone. But over the next three or four weeks, winter was pretty good. Well, we're getting into a colder pattern again, a colder, snowier pattern across the country. That trend may sustain itself over the course of the next couple of months. And finally, China, second largest economy in the world, has reemerged from their self-imposed COVID lockdown. Uh, they produced only 3% GDP growth last year, the weakest year for them, I think, in a half a century they need to get GDP back to six to 8%. So they have reopened uh, the country. Uh, there's gonna be a significant amount of economic activity that will uh, force a stronger demand for energy coming out of China. And I think will help to lift global energy prices. So for all those reasons, we expect that energy prices are gonna go higher this year, and that is going to elevate the levels of inflation. All right, slide 20. No. Uh... Yes. As questions are coming in, and we've got a uh, a hard a hard stop at uh, twelve thirty here. As far as just thinking of everyone of time, I just was reading some of these questions and thinking about the parts of the presentation you've already gone through. One here is, and you kind of ended on it. You know, how much is the U.S. economy dependent upon uh, Western Europe and China? Well, significant. Uh, China is the second largest economy in the world. Uh, Japan is number three, Germany's number four, England's number five, India's number six. So China and, and the European Union are significant trading partners of ours. So if those economies are weak now, that has a deleterious impact on us. If they improve over the course of the next year or two, 
uh, that is very important for us as having a, a, a stronger trade partner in terms of, of uh, the balance of trade, being able to increase our exports to those countries. So going back to the idea of inflation, kind of the theme of today's conversation, you know, thinking about another question that was put out, you know, what was the role of the COVID shutdown, you know, shortage, the shortage of the different manufacturing goods? I know you have a slide in here about the ISM numbers. Uh, you know, thinking about the Ukraine Russian war and fueling inflation, kind of putting that together, is that another reason why inflation could have been hot? Going back, uh, just thinking of other things out there other than just the uh, fiscal policy. No, I, I think the fiscal policy ties in very closely with the supply chain problems in, right. in COVID that, uh, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you've all seen stories of the fact that we had 100, 150 ships uh, parked off of the, uh, of the Pacific coast that, that couldn't get into the United States to unload their goods. Uh, and so as we were pumping literally five or six trillion dollars of additional stimulus in the economy, people were flush with money. They wanted to buy stuff, but there was a shortage of goods based upon the shipping problems out on the West Coast. So what happens? What's the clearing mechanism in order to get prices, uh, supply and demand into equilibrium? Prices went up. Now, we're in a much better place today. That 100 to 150 ship backlog in the Pacific is done. Zero bagel. So as a result, company stores now have an excess of inventory, but they've got that inventory at the wrong part of the cycle. We're now starting to contract. We're not looking to buy the same stuff we were buying two years ago, three years ago. But that imbalance, too much money chasing too few goods is exactly what raised the inflation levels within the economy. Thank you. Uh, those are the questions I saw so far. So we'll, we'll continue the presentation and I'll, uh, I'll pause it as I see them. Excellent. All right. Uh, so on slide 20, the next page, uh, I want to spend a moment talking about personal balance sheets, particularly for the lower half of America, are, are stressed right now. Uh, starting in the upper left-hand corner, the personal savings rate uh, from 34%. Uh, with the first CARES Act and 26% at the ARP Act in March of 21. Two years later, the savings rate right now is sitting literally a tick off of a 17-year low. We have drawn those savings down. So what are we doing? Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, we're using our credit cards more. Uh, credit card debt is up 17% over the last year. The lower right-hand corner, uh, not surprisingly, there is a surge in delinquencies 2.1% the third quarter of last year. That number is going higher. And in the upper right-hand corner, excess savings have been literally cut in half over the last year. From $2.3 trillion in the third quarter of calendar 21, we're sitting at an estimated $1.2 trillion right now. But looking at the top half but the bottom versus the bottom half of America, the top half of America, a trillion dollars in savings, the bottom half, $200 billion. So I think the bottom half of America is going to be stressed. Uh, and we can see that with slide 21, the consumer stress indicator. This is sort of a modern approach of the old misery index that we saw uh, on slide 21, Sam, uh, under uh, President Carter. Now, the rate of unemployment is very low, sitting at a 53-year low of 3.5%. Of, uh, but when you look at uh, the price of groceries at home, cost of eggs, up 13% year on year right now. Mortgage rates have more than doubled, 3% to 7.35%. Gasoline prices, we talked about more than doubling. All of that translates into a consumer stress indicator that is north of 20%. Whenever we've seen these spikes over the course of history, that has contributed to the onset of recession. The housing market, Sam, on slide 22. Uh, housing prices in the upper left-hand corner record high housing prices, not sustainable. They've got to come down. The lower left-hand corner, mortgage rates more than doubled, 3% to 7.35%, not sustainable. They're starting to come down. They're below 7% now. In the upper right-hand corner, affordability. Housing affordability hasn't been this bad since the mid-1980s. Aside from higher mortgage rates and record high housing prices, inflation has eroded our purchasing power. Yeah, we're getting 5% raises, which is great, but if inflation is running 8 or 9%, we're running negative purchasing power. All of that combined 
to push the marginal buyer into the rental market. And that makes perfect sense because the rental prices only go up, you know, two, 3% a year, except in the last two years, rental prices went up by 25%. None of that is sustainable. And as we look at the next slide, Sam 23, you can see what that has done is contributed to the risk of recession. This is the HMI, the housing market index. Over the last two years, it has plunged from 90 to 31. It's dropped 60 points in the last two years. And you can see over the course of history, that's contributed to recession. Flipping ahead to slide 24. Uh, Phil. Yeah. So you, you, now the questions are flying in since I, uh, I came in with it. So kind of going back to this, um, uh, just thinking about different ways these questions are being asked. So how does the U.S. fiscal stimulus uh, cause worldwide inflation? It doesn't cause worldwide inflation other than the fact that we're the greatest economy in the world, accounting for 25 percent of GDP. So we, to some degree, are exporting our inflation based upon the prices of goods that we're demanding in order to export to other countries. And you know, something you brought up earlier, we're going over different time periods. I thought this was an interesting uh, question, though. What is the view of the impact of the massive tax cuts, cuts approved by Congress in 2017 and, it, and its impact upon this year's uh, deficit? Uh, none, because what that did, those tax cuts helped to boost gross domestic product in the 2018, 2019, early 2020 period. Um, so, so putting that money back in the hands of corporations and individuals allowed them to make their own spending decisions. The points that I'm trying to make here with the five and a half trillion dollars of excess fiscal spending is that that money was not spent well and it contributed to the, the, the spike in inflation. Here, here's the, uh, I guess, the eight hundred million dollar question. Uh, you know, what additional steps should we be taking today to help curb inflation and avoid recession if it's even possible? Well, and, and that's the point. Um, I, I think the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, has literally ripped a page from Paul Volcker's playbook 40 years ago. And, and Volcker intentionally took the Fed funds rate up to 20% to drive the economy in a recession. He needed to break the back of inflation and, and realized that getting unemployment to 10%, getting the economy in a recession was the only way to achieve that. Now, that was the beginning of my career. It was very painful. We had a double dip recession in the early 1980s. But when you cleared the decks, what that did is it set the table for what turned out to be a 40-year bull market in bonds and stocks. I think that's exactly what Powell is trying to do right now. And, and is, I'll, I'll give you one analogy that I've used with some success, Sam. You know, Think in terms of a bonfire that's growing on your front lawn. All right, what, what do you do? You look out your front window, you see this bonfire, you call the fire department, right? The fire department comes over, that's the Federal Reserve. And they take out their hose and they're throwing water on this on this bonfire. They're trying to put this fire out. But on the other side of the fire are our friends in Washington that are throwing kerosene out of the same fire. That's the fiscal stimulus. So you've got fiscal stimulus or fiscal policy and monetary policy that are sort of working across purposes. So the Federal Reserve is not raising interest rates and trying to push the economy in a recession because they want to. They feel that they have to. And in order to bring inflation back to target, if you if you go back to that kind of or thinking of a crystal ball idea, you know, uh, how big would the effect of a positive uh, resolution in Ukraine be, for, I guess, in the U.S. and in the globe? Well, I, I think that would be significant because there, the, the dislocation we've seen in energy might ease and the amount of money that the United States and Europe and other NATO allies are funneling into Ukraine uh, would stop. Uh, and I'm sure we would stick the Russians with a, you know, a ten trillion dollar rebuild uh, bill for uh, rebuilding, uh, you know, Ukraine, all the damage they've done, uh, destroying apartment buildings and infrastructure and the like. So, so that would start to put us in the right direction uh, in terms of bringing global inflation down. I, I don't think that that what Russia is doing though is is an economically driven process. I, I you know, it's been our view. That that uh, that that Putin uh, is doing this to fulfill a lifelong ambition to recreate or attempt to recreate uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union in the last century. Uh, so he's being driven by other legacy issues, not economic issues. 
Understood. Okay. All right. Uh, I just wanted to put it out there for uh, Steve and Phil, our kind of the Wells Fargo advisors. Uh, you know, if there's anything they want to uh, bring up with the group as far as additional questions or bring in uh, additional ideas for Phil Orlando here. Okay. Sam, I wanted to make yeah. sure that we got into the last elements of our discussion, value versus growth, uh, why dividends are important, and, uh, and take any additional questions. So I'm going to ask you to flip ahead to slide 29 right now. Okay. Well, uh, I think I've made my back point back. that the U.S. economy has a glide path in a recession based upon these issues. Now, uh, I want you to focus in the lower right-hand corner, and I've got some updates this morning based upon the flash report on fourth quarter GDP. Uh, in fourth quarter GDP, uh, we were estimating 2.3%. Uh, the Atlanta Fed was up around 4.5%. The number came in at 2.9, and which means that the full year number, instead of our 2% estimate, has come in at 2.1%. Now, our forecast, so we had you know, roughly 6% GDP last year, 5.9%. Uh, We've got 2.1% now for last year. And then our forecast for this year uh, has been revised now to a 0.8 increase versus the 0.6 we have there based upon the adjustment to the base. So what you're seeing, I think, is a, is a clear decline or deceleration in economic growth. The question is, will that deceleration result in a soft landing, just slower growth, or will we actually get into a hard landing, an actual recession? And the answer is we don't know that yet. But you can see that, that looking at our quarterly projections for GDP growth, uh, we do have a slower first quarter this year, 0.5, and then three negative quarters in a row to finish up the year. So uh, clearly the deceleration is gonna continue. Now, as you flip ahead to the next slide, Sam, slide 30, the combination of higher interest rates, higher inflation, uh, that's going to slow the economy, slow corporate earnings, price earnings multiples contract. Uh, and so what we're looking at is a period where the market, we believe, is going to reevaluate itself based upon the decline in earnings. So the fourth quarter earnings season, we're about a quarter of the way through. Uh, expectations in the third quarter, looking at the fourth quarter, was that earnings were going to be up about 10% year on year. Pretty good. But just before the earnings season started, those consensus earnings had come down to a decline of about 5% year in year. It was about a 15% swing in earnings. So far, we're down about 8%, 8 9% year on year in terms of the early stages of this fourth quarter. And because it's fourth quarter earnings, we believe the companies are going to provide full year guidance for calendar uh, 23, which are going to be we think severely challenged. The economy is slowing, so top lines coming in. Profit margins are shrinking, higher labor costs, higher commodity costs, higher transportation costs, higher warehousing costs. Inventories are a mess. Companies are cutting prices in order to reduce inventory. So all of that we think is going to result in, in slimmer uh, earnings for calendar uh, 23. So if you go down to the third line from the bottom, the S&P 500 line, uh, and look at calendar 22 versus calendar 23. Uh, we're still expecting $220 in earnings for last year. But for this year, we cut our estimate about three months ago from $230 in earnings down to $200. We're expecting a 10% decline in earnings this year. Now, the consensus has cut their number over that same period of time from $250 down to about $230. The consensus is still looking for about a 5% increase in corporate earnings. We think those numbers are too high. And we think that over the course of the next couple of months, earnings estimates are going to come in, and that's going to cause the stock market to drop from uh, the quintuple top at about 4,100, technically speaking. We think the market's going to go back and retest that mid-October low at about 3,500. And then we'll sort of see where we are from there based upon how bad uh, the decline or the revisions in earnings are for calendar 23. So from that point, again, we think we go into a recession 
uh, at the very end of this year, the beginning of next year, the Federal Reserve, which likely has been on pause over that period of time, we think starts to cut interest rates uh, at some point during calendar 24. And then the equity market is a forward-looking discounting mechanism in the fourth quarter of this year begins to price in the expectations of an economic rebound at the back end of next year, fueled by a reduction in interest rates by the Federal Reserve. So the stock market then we think begins to rally in the fourth quarter of this year, beginning to price in the economic and corporate earnings recovery in calendar uh, 24. Sam, if you'd flip so, ahead to so, slide 32. No, Sorry, the, go ahead. The amount of questions are they're they're firing in now. Uh, so we'll pause here on the presentation because uh, David uh, Bean wants to come back in as well as Steve and Phil uh, Pappas uh, would like to um, uh, uh, say a few thoughts as well. So I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Steve and then he'll turn it over to uh, David Bean. Uh, so go ahead, Steve. Okay, first I wanted to thank uh, David Carroll Federated and Phil Orlando for making this possible. And uh, just one question regarding investments. Uh, Phil, could you talk about the implications of higher interest rates, higher inflation, and growth versus value securities? Absolutely. Sam McGowan, flip ahead to slide 32. Uh, if you look in the lower left-hand corner, our overweights are domestic value, both large and small cap and international. Those are the areas that we've got the best attraction. If you look in the upper right-hand corner there, our overweight categories are the stable demand stocks that are cheaper, have lower betas, and have much higher dividend yields. Energy, healthcare, uh, staples. Uh, Sam, flip ahead one slide to slide 33. Look at the histogram in the lower right-hand corner. The first two bars, value versus growth. Value right now is 39% cheaper than growth domestically. The two middle bars, small cap versus large cap. Small cap is 34% cheaper. The last two bars, international versus domestic. International is 38% cheaper. So for all the reasons that we've talked about, we still expect some chop in the market over the course of the next six to nine months. We are focused on value stocks, small cap stocks, international stocks that are cheaper, lower betas, and have much higher dividend yield support. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Phil, uh, Pavis, did you want to uh, say anything? No, it was really one more question for uh, Mr. Orlando. In yes, terms sir. of price earnings multiples, at the end of 23, I saw you had 17.9 right. uh, listed on there. At what point does the market start to expand the multiple based on the anticipation of the Fed cutting rates? So at this point, we're not there yet because the Fed is still raising interest rates. We think multiples will probably pull back into the mid-teens over the course of the next six to nine months. Let's call it uh, 14 or 15 times earnings. And then we'll start to expand multiples again later this year or next year as the Federal Reserve comes off pause and actually starts to reduce the Fed funds rate. And we're going to have to wrap it up there to get you guys out of here on time. So I'm going to ask uh, David Bean to come back on for his final comments. So, uh, Phil, thank you to you and your team for a very informative presentation today. Um, just to kind of wrap things up with our members about upcoming programs. So we have two programs scheduled in February. Uh, the first is on the 8th. Uh, that is a, an in-person presentation at Legends. Um, by Doug Metcalf, uh, who's a retired local healthcare executive uh, and is currently a community volunteer activist and advocate. He's going to address us on uh, recent travels uh, that he undertook to Nepal. Then on February the 15th, we have a virtual uh, program um, by Dr. Robert Hink at the Air War College, who's going to talk to us about assessment of Russian and Chinese media. Uh, we currently do not have a date for March, but we do have a speaker confirmed for International Women's Day. It's going to be local representative Johanny Cepeda Freilitz. Um, she's currently waiting on her legislative calendar to figure out when we're going to be able to fit that in, but that is going to be a live presentation for March. Uh, then on April, on the 12th, we have Dr. Spencer Stober from Alvernia, who's going to address us on climate change. 
And finally, on May the 17th, I noticed when I checked this morning that the website, at least the one I looked at, it's still not corrected. It's still showing this presentation for March, for April the 12th, uh, but the date is May the 17th. Uh, that is a, an in-person presentation at Legends uh, by Ambassador Charles Ray, who has addressed us before. Uh, he's going to talk to us about race and American diplomacy. Uh, so with that, uh, a thank you to all of our members who were able to attend today. And again, a big thank you to Philip and his team for a very informative presentation. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.